Welcome back. I hope you're all suitably refreshed and ready to go again. We're now on the home straight. Our final presentations will now focus on the thoughts of the UK safety regulators, both the Civil Aviation Authority and the Health and Safety Executive, and how they can best facilitate the progression of system safety thinking. It's my great pleasure to first introduce Catherine Jones from the UK CAA. Catherine has worked in aviation since 1989 in the areas of flight operations and human factors, and is currently at the UK CAA as manager of the safety improvement team and human factors program lead. Catherine is also the UK representative on the IKO Fatigue Risk Management System Task Force, and is working with IKO as a member of the Human Performance Task Force to develop the, hum the new Human Performance Guidance Manual. To mitigate the risk of external distractions where Catherine is broadcasting from today, she's chosen to pre-record her presentation, but is present um, to monitor chats and will be live on the panel session at the end of the day. So, to Catherine's presentation. Sorry, everyone. I'll sort this out in a second. Okay. So today I'd like to. Hello, my name's Catherine Jones. I work for the Civil Aviation Authority as the manager of the safety improvement team and also the human factors program lead. Our safety improvement team works across all areas from safety management, research, human factors, and also very much into the horizon scanning. So those things that are going to fall into regulatory activities in the next 10 or 20 years. This enables us to get an awful lot of information from across all areas of the industry and also to look at how those future developments will be influencing the system. So today, I'd like to talk to you about the regulatory developments, very much introduce you to the IKO Human Performance Manual for Regulators, which is going to be available very shortly online for free download. I'd also want to give you some highlights of our Civil Aviation Authority systems approach and the work that we're doing and also remind people about those five major human factors destinations from the Chartered Institute white paper and the fact we will all be working towards those in the future. To start my presentation, I'd like to highlight the ICAO resolution from 2019 regarding human performance. It recognises that human performance is influenced by physiological and cognitive capabilities and constraints, but it contributes significantly to the overall safety performance of the aviation system. So it's requiring member states to really consider how they integrate human performance into new processes, technologies and change. It looks to promote the integration of human performance elements within training throughout the career of a professional. And it also highlights that member states need to include strategies to promote safe, consistent, efficient and effective operational performance of the individual and across teams to address safety priorities. So it sets the groundwork 
for what we're all trying to do as regulators, which is make it easy for people to do the right thing. So the ICAO manual was developed over the last couple of years with a group of multi-stakeholders, of scientists, of regulators, of pilots, of controllers. It was really looking to bring together all that wealth of experience from the different aspects of the industry to help us better understand how we can make it easy for people to do the right thing and for the aviation system to improve its safety performance. So the manual in part one seeks to introduce some terminology and concepts to enable regulators to understand why systems thinking and safety two approaches are important to understand and why they matter to regulators. It provides the foundation for part two, which is where we talk about the tasks that regulators are required to work on. And it introduces the notions of systems thinking, human centered design, as well as those five human performance principles. So the challenge of identifying human performance versus human factors, because there are multiple definitions for human factors and then human performance. So for the purposes of the manual, this is how we distinguish between human performance and human factors. And we're looking at this as human performance as what happens on the day, how people perform their tasks on the day and to develop that greater understanding of those influences and how they contribute. So human factors encompasses all the knowledge that we have from a wide range of scientific disciplines and research activities. All of those activities and knowledge seeks to support human performance as it is applied to the design and evaluation of equipment and environments and work. And it all looks to focus on improving human performance within the system and thereby system performance and system safety. What we're very much trying to do is add that element of on the day, why theory and practice in practice are the same. So what is a system? Well, the aviation system is a system of systems. It's important to understand the differences and the interactions between the different kind of systems within it. Simple systems are relatively easy to understand. They have a predictable performance. They have a one or maybe a small number of known goals or functions that don't change over time and they meet pre-identified performance standards. The passenger emergency lighting system used to guide passengers out of an aircraft in emergency would be one such system. And then when we move to complicated systems, this is where the structure and elements might be difficult to understand, but can be understood and quantified with a high degree of accuracy by experts. Knowledge is normally developed in a linear way and can be designed to meet pre-identified performance standards. So something like a jet engine, which has several goals, but they remain the same over time. So for the engine, it would be to produce thrust, but also to generate electricity and hydraulic pressure. This is an example of a complicated system where we have known interactions and when things go wrong, it's quite easy to identify where you have that knowledge, what element needs to be replaced or improved. However, when we move to complex systems, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Everything is connected to and dependent on something else. Importantly, the behavior of the system cannot be predicted by examining the behavior of its separate parts. And the system cannot be understood by only looking at one component or from one perspective. Complex systems are subject to random and unpredictable events due to those multiple and changing interfaces and interactions within the systems. And humans ourselves are complex system. An individual may change behavior or adapting to internal influences such as health or mood, as well as those external influences such as environment and equipment. So any interaction between humans and technology, regardless of the technology, 
changes the nature of that whole human technology system, making it a complex one. And then very much the global aviation system is therefore a complex socio-technical system. It's a network of people, technologies and environments that are all interconnected and all influence each other and can all have those environmental effects bring differences every day. So what the manual has done is introduce systems thinking as a way of supporting regulators to understand that any change, including those related to new technologies, may not necessarily reduce complexity or the possibility of errors, but may shift these into different parts of the system with different consequences. It's looking to encourage regulators to take a multiple perspectives on situations, problems and opportunities to support human performance and then apply them within their regulatory functions. We've also developed five human performance principles and included examples of their application that combined with the other elements in the manual aims to support regulators as they develop their approaches focused on supporting people in whatever role they have. This will become increasingly more important as technology changes and the system evolves. One of the first tasks that we had when developing the ICAO Human Performance Manual was what are the principles? And we came up with a lot and I'm sure everyone else could add to these list. But we wanted then to distill that down into these five useful principles for any work that can deal with any group of people anywhere within the aviation system. We wanted them to be very much fitting in with that systems thinking approach and think more broadly than just being applicable to an individual event. These principles are informed by research and operational experience, and they highlight those different aspects of human performance. These principles also interact and overlap to some extent with each other. So the first principle about capabilities and limitations could be described as everything is capabilities and limitations for people. The fifth principle is about some of the external factors that influence human, fact, human performance. In fact, all such observations could be described in that way. So these principles are not an attempt to create a categorization scheme. They are actually within each category, a discrete building block of human performance. So they don't present that categorization. Instead, they provide different insights and perspectives to come closer to that multidimensional picture of human performance on the day of operation. They apply generally to everybody involved in aviation at an individual, a team and an organisational level. And they're also relevant, therefore, to us as a regulator within our own organisation and to our own people. So why is systems thinking important for regulators? Well, in aviation, we are a global community and there is global interoperability. The regulatory actions within the systems affect people, what they do, how they do it, whether directly or indirectly. And regulatory actions directed at a specific group may also affect the actions of other groups of people and sometimes in unexpected ways. So for example, making a change in a flight date procedure at an airline of one country can affect the ground crew at an airport of a different country, which could affect the ramp operation and thereby affecting the airport and the other airlines using that airport. Therefore, regulators need to use appropriate methods and tools when we're looking at developing regulatory approaches, how we evaluate and how we approve the various elements within the system. And many of our tools and methods may be more in use just looking at a single evaluation process for a simple or a complicated system, rather than taking that step back and evaluating the vast range of different interactions that are ongoing between and within the complex systems that make up the global aviation environment. So we need to understand how change in one part can impact another, how context is so important when we develop our regulations, how we 
understand any risk transfer possibilities or seek to understand once regulation is in what that has actually had an effect on. Also to take that multiple perspective, that stepping back and looking at problems, opportunities and the situation which could both support or impact on human performance and seek to understand that knowledge and apply it within our regulatory functions. Part two of the manual starts with our state safety programme. This is the means by which a state manages the safety risks in their national aviation system. And in this part focuses very much on the key regulatory activities which are necessary for the implementation of an SSP. Now, since human performance considerations are embedded in many aspects of an SSP, part two provides that guidance for the application of human performance considerations to assist regulatory staff in being able to better perform their required job functions, whether you are a policy officer, whether you are a direct inspector, whether you are looking at various other activities within the aviation system. And because ICAO provisions are also developed to direct and support states regulatory activities, this part of the manual is also applicable to the development of those ICAO provisions. So as ICAO panels sit and they're looking to develop regulations, maybe for new technology or update current regulations, this part of the human performance manual applies to them too. Because the SARPs drive the regulatory requirements by a state and therefore human performance considerations are essential to the development of those SARPs and the supporting guidance material. Part two then goes on to supporting regulators with those more specific tasks of when to regulate, how they go about looking at examining the risk, that collection and analysis of data, what type of regulatory material they should be developing, what level within regulatory law, and guidance material as well to support the application so that evidencing of best practice in support of regulations. And then also to help regulators understand how they can apply human performance principles when they are doing their assessment and evaluation of approving different systems, technology, equipment or procedures. The manual then goes on to make this more practical for the oversight of these aspects. So we'd be looking to find evidence of how effectively an organisation was addressing human performance considerations in its day to day operations. And there we need to focus on reporting, uh, assessment processes, investigation processes, training and very importantly as well, the management of change. So what does this mean for the CAA? Well, we are very much looking forward to the publication of the manual and to refining and developing our approaches towards examining and understanding human factors and human performance principles to improve aviation safety. But this has been our view for a while. So while it's nothing new as such, because we have a published strategy focused on that from a human factors perspective, what it will enable us to do is embed those activities described in the manual in a broader sense. And we're already working on aspects of that today. Within the CAA, we're gathering data from all areas of the industry. And this includes gathering information as part of ongoing safety conversations that we hold with our organisations, with our stakeholders, across the UK with other safety industries, and obviously internationally with our collaborative partnerships. We bring together that information to identify both specific area risks and also broader safety issues. This enables us to identify where we want to focus our key safety improvement areas. And we'd be looking to drive changes in safety behaviours through utilising that cross-disciplinary expertise to create wider learning on those safety areas. We do that through a number of activities and they are through our programmes of safety work and this includes our ongoing human factors programme but it could be shorter programmes such as the programme of activity associated with Covid restart. We're looking at how our publications 
can meet the needs of the industry. And that can be through stakeholder promotional activities, such as workshopping ideas or areas and identifying different ways in which we can promote the message that we need to get out to the industry. And of course, we need to see how that's landing. And we do that in several ways, obviously through feedback from industry partners, but also as part of our oversight activities, where we look to see if people have used the information we've produced, how it's landed, and how it is applied in the specific context in where we're seeking to make that change. And we review all that information, and then we repeat the process. Constantly seeking to better understand what the industry needs from us. I also wanted to highlight a project that we've been supporting for several years at Luton Airport. And its key message that I would like to leave everyone with is that of the importance of collaboration. This safety initiative at Luton Airport was to bring together all the stakeholders to jointly look at safety and each other's impact on safety, both negative and positive, at this particular airport. It was a real example of industry understanding that compliance with generic regulation is one thing, but working together to understand each other in specific operational environments was where they could all contribute to the safety of the system. So the white paper goes on to outline those five major human factors destinations that we can expect aviation to develop and to become more embedded in the system by 2050. Now I could talk about each of these in detail as they're all on our agenda, but I have talked about some of them already, so I will start at the bottom of this list with that future governments piece, as this is where we as regulators have our biggest challenge. And I'd just like to point out as well, we have a sixth challenge and destination, and that is space. But I shan't dwell on that for this presentation. So our dynamic environment requires a flexible approach, and we do not want to have compliance at the expense of safety. We need to understand those real world influences and operational contexts, as they are key to understanding how and why we are safe. We want to encourage regulations and implementation that inherently considers how to help people perform at their best. And we will continue to look at best practice guidance material from around the world. I just wanted to highlight some core questions that should always be asked at the start of any project, or else you'll find yourself having to go back and ask them anyway in order to fully understand what is being requested or developed. These will be in the ICAO manual, and they came from work that was done on the global airspace upgrade work. The focus there had been on the technology and had already progressed, but had left out the people question. So we had to go back and develop a series of high level questions to support that understanding and then break that down into more detailed supporting areas of inquiry. We are now encouraging others to always ask these questions with any change of equipment, technology or procedure. We do need to explicitly ask the question and require demonstration of the answers. Often human factors and human performance requirements are implicit within a regulation, but we need more than ever for everyone to understand that this needs to be evidenced. So what I'd like to leave everybody with is understanding that systems thinking and thinking beyond the traditional approaches to safety is for all of us. And we can all learn through collaborative activities, through keeping curious about what is going on in our own environments and the impacts that our actions are having and why people did what they did at that time. And also to have that consideration of the wider picture, not only 
just what is happening in our particular aspect, but how what we are doing may impact on others. So I'd like to thank you for your time and attention this afternoon and look forward to taking questions later. Thank you, Catherine, for a very comprehensive presentation and for your insights into the ICAO Human Performance Guidance Manual. I think it's really encouraging to see the emphasis and direction that um, ICAO have taken as evidenced by those five guiding principles on system thinking. Also, like your characterization of a complex system's whole being greater than the sum of its individual parts. So, to our final presentation um, for this conference, last but by no means least, to the Health and Safety Executive and my privilege to introduce Ed Corbett. Ed leads one of the largest human factors teams in the world for the UK Health and Safety Executive and works with many organisations to improve their safety, efficiency and performance. The floor is yours, Ed. Thanks, George. Just working out how to get my screen back on one second. OK. Yeah, I should probably add to that, probably since that, uh, can you see my screen now? Is that up? Yep, all good. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I think probably since that uh, bio was written, I think we've uh, downsized quite significantly, so we might not be uh, one of the largest anymore. But uh, thank you for the introduction, Jodie, and uh, hopefully give you a bit of a perspective from uh, from HTC. Um, so yeah, I'm I guess going to represent HTC on, or from a human factors perspective, and when I mention human factors, uh, I mean that in terms of the sort of scientific discipline of human factors. So sometimes we talk about human factors in terms of things like crew resource management or non-technical skills. And I'm talking about the larger or broader discipline uh, of human factors where we're looking at, uh, I guess you could put it in the, in, in the framing of systems thinking, of the design of the work environment that people are in, the context that people are working in, uh, as well as the social side, the social environment that people are working in, the, the leadership, the culture and those kind of factors as well. Uh, by background, I'm a chartered psychologist. Uh, I've worked for HC twice. Previously, um, was in the organisation I left and worked primarily in high hazard organisations in the oil and gas sector, particularly working around the world, particularly in the, the Gulf of Mexico uh, and the UK uh, offshore uh, sector as well. Um, so I guess I bring a lot of that higher hazard context to the conversation and some of what I'll be presenting today. Uh, as a bit of an outline as to the content of what I plan on talking you through. Uh, first of all, I'll just give you a bit of background to HSE. Uh, we're obviously not the main regulator for the aviation sector, but we do have some overlaps with CAA and have a memorandum of understanding to uh, help clarify where some of that overlap might be and uh, ensure that if there's any sort of enforcement action that there's clarity uh, for duty holders there as well. Uh, I will talk a little bit about, or run you through a little bit of the data that we collect uh, around incidents in Great Britain. Um, more so to just illustrate the scale of some of the issues that we face in relation to health and safety. Uh, it is very much focused on lagging data. It's quite difficult from a sort of a national scale to collect leading indicator data. That's obviously going to map quite significantly to specific issues within certain organisations and their sectors. So we do tend to focus on that, on that lagging type data. Um, I will give some observations from a HSC perspective, but I'll also bring in some of those perspectives from working as a consultant out in industry um, and some of those maybe um, perceptions and experiences that you get um, when you are part of organisations, when you're a consultant for organisations. There is that sort of um, cliche that if you're an inspector, for example, you go around and everything smells of um, fresh paint and the red carpet gets rolled out and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, I think there are two different uh, perspectives that you might see from those angles. I'll try and bring those out a little bit. Uh, and I'll try and promote a view, I guess, that encompasses safety science more broadly. So um, there are different perspectives and different approaches which have been refer referred to quite a lot over the last couple of days. So human factors, obviously, human and organisational performance. We hear about system safety, safety two, safety differently, and new view and so on. Uh, and I guess what I'm going to do for the purpose of today is kind of group all of those different perspectives together and put them under the umbrella of safety science. So uh, I think from a HSE point of view, uh, I guess what is important is what's being done is, is evidence based to some extent that it's, it's logical, it's rational what we're doing. Uh, and we're 
we do develop that evidence base or industry develops that evidence base, academics develop that evidence base. And that's what's important really um, for making those changes and um, making workplaces safer. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of background on our mission. So this is our high level mission to prevent death, injury and ill health in Great Britain workplaces uh, with that add on of by becoming part of the solution as well. I guess what we are most well known for though is this investigation side. So investigating work related accidents and ill health and taking enforcement action linked to that as well. Um, I guess maybe something that isn't so well known is the three uh, th three key strands that make up HSC. So we have the science and research side, we have the regulatory side, which is probably the most well known, and the policy side. Uh, so I work in, in science division within HSC, um, and we provide specialist input on the regulatory side, but also on the policy side as well, and conduct a lot of that research and collect and develop that evidence base, which feeds into some of the regulation and policy as well. I think an important point to make quite early on as well is what guides a lot of HSC's decision making and the framework that we work within. So a fundamental principle underpinning the Health and Safety at Work Act is that those who create risks from work activity are responsible for protecting workers and the public from the consequences. Um, so this is a really important point to note quite early on that um, it's deemed that um, I guess businesses, organisations that are out there often making money from the, uh, uh, the businesses, the operations that they run. Uh, it's important that they are aware of the, the risks that they create and protect employers and the wider society from the harm that could be caused by those as well. So those who create the risk own the risk and are responsible for, uh, for making sure that people don't get harmed. Uh, that's from, yeah, if you're interested, that's from our document, Reducing Risk Protecting People, sometimes referred to as R2P2. Uh, I think, yeah, maybe a final point that's just important to note about um, I guess where HEC are coming from in a lot of cases is that it's it's certainly not about individual error um, and that from an organisational point of view uh, blaming issues on individual error, error isn't really going to inoculate those organisations or leaders from accountability um, so I think that's a really important point to, to make as well whilst a lot of organisations go down this path of, of blame uh, it isn't actually going to protect the organisation or the sort of leadership teams, the sort of um, the business owners and so on from uh, from the accountability. So picking up on some of the GB stats, um, yeah, just to give you a bit of a, a scale of some of the issues, uh, these have largely sort of plateaued for a number of years now. Um, but you can see the fatal injuries. This is 18, 19, 147. Uh, non-fatals near 70,000 and also I think a big one for me I'm quite interested in the topic of well-being and stress at work and obviously that has a individual impact but also can have an impact on a sort of major hazard as well or higher hazard um, uh, issues as well and also the health health related fatalities which you can see at the bottom there sort of lung related deaths 12,000 mesothelioma deaths another two and a half thousand as well so actually sometimes we forget the significance of the health related um, impact that, that work can have on us as well. The data from a year on, which is probably going to be um, impacted to some extent by um, overlapping with the COVID uh, crisis that we're still in. Um, and we can see that the pattern is again quite similar. Um, I think interestingly and perhaps quite significantly is the increase in the, uh, the, the numbers on work related stress there. So from 0.6 million the year before to 0.8 million as well. So uh, I think that's quite a concerning change that we see there. Um, I think any health and safety practitioner, when you sort of enter into the field of, of health and safety, we get sort of pushed down a pathway of understanding certain cases for doing health and safety, for putting effort and energy into health and safety. And I'll come back to this point, I think, throughout the session, because I think it's quite important when we tie it into leadership and influencing health and safety. Uh, one of those cases is the moral case and it's always uh, perplexed me to some extent that um, uh, I mean we define it as it's the right thing to do it's the, the moral thing it's the right thing to do to look after people to take care of their health and their safety and protect them from the hazards that we create through the work activities that, that we produce. Uh, the thing that I find perplexing and interesting though is the fact that we have more cases than this which would suggest maybe to some extent that uh, we don't have the level of sort of morality that we would like to assume. So we also have uh, on top of that, we have financial, so the, the sort of carrot, if you like. So uh, doing health and safety can, can save us money, can increase efficiencies in the workplace in some cases. It's not always a trade-off between one or the other. 
although that's sometimes a difficult uh, case to prove. And it can also uh, protect us from some of the costs associated with things like litigation. I think it was uh, Trevor Kletz who made the, uh, the, the comment or quote, didn't he, that uh, if you think safety is uh, expensive, then try having an accident. So there's that, that financial element as well. I guess where we come into some extent is on that legal side as well, the sort of stick approach, uh, and there are penalties for not doing health and safety as well. So again, that's often tied into uh, leadership and accountabilities of um, management, uh, not putting into place the effective and the right measures to control the risk that they've created as part of their business. Um, moving on a little bit to, to leadership as well. So I think this ties in quite nicely to some of the comments we've heard of the last, of the last few days about um, the, the blunt end, if you like, of the organisation. So uh, the management, the leadership perspective. Uh, and this is a quote from uh, Milton Friedman, which uh, a few friends have interest, introduced me to in recent times. So there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game. And I'll let you read the rest of that. And that links into a lot of similar perspectives from those who work in the field of uh, management and leadership, uh, that a key driver in that executive culture is financial performance. Uh, so this is, I think, an important one that we can't forget about in relation to, uh, to business is that key drivers are around that financial performance and whether that be stemming from uh, the sort of culture that derives from the MBA mentality uh, and also the executive uh, career path as well. So CV, CV, CV building, if you're a director or a CEO moving from one organisation to another is that your impact on the financial side of a business is absolutely essential for your progression uh, and staying in the, in the career. So it's probably not surprising then when we see, when we see operationalizing safety, um, what are some of the um, primary objectives there? So we often hear this uh, sort of story about being safe is, uh, is a key objective, and that's often operationalized into strap lines such as safety is their number one priority, uh, things like zero harm and so on. And I'm not going to bore you, I'm sure you've all heard some of the critique of those sorts of um, platitudes over the years as well. Uh, but essentially, they don't really um, link very well to things like alert principles, we, which we expect to see from a, a regulatory point of view. If we're aiming for as low as is reasonably practicable, uh, then that's very different to zero harm or safety being a number one priority. Um, those sort of platitudes also contradict um, how much we are willing to invest, whether that be resources, money or anything else, into achieving safety. Uh, and that then conflicts with how honest we are from a leadership point of view in, in representing safety as our number one priority or trying to achieve zero harm and can damage trust as well with the workforce. If we're trying to promote something which the workforce see as, as false, then that's going to damage the trust as well. Unsurprisingly as well, we also see that uh, linked to gaming of targets as well. So targets being achieved uh, in relation to reducing often lagging um, data related to uh, safety performance, but those targets being gamed by, uh, by individuals within organisations to make sure they achieve uh, the targets that are set for them. So lots of challenges that come out of that, that kind of mentality. Um, so yeah, this focus then if we move into maximising profit for shareholders to get stuff done ultimately to, to achieve that profit. Uh, and I think we're all full foul of that as well. I think if we think about our own money and how we manage that money in pension funds, investments, you know, do we actually care about uh, how and where that is invested? You know, do we, for our investments, do we check? Um, is it invested in companies that look after their employees? You know, they have a good health and safety record. They have a good record when it comes to not damaging the environment and so on. Uh, so you can see we're probably all guilty ourselves in some way of, of focusing on that sort of profit side, maximising our investments uh, and the getting stuff done culture as well. So we start then to lead into how that links into some of the goal conflicts. Again, something that's been talked about a lot over the last couple of days. So we can see that a lot of the goal conflicts in, in many workplaces stem from that uh, drive to achieve productivity, uh, efficiency, and again, ultimately getting stuff done, that culture of getting stuff done. I think more worryingly, maybe in the last decade or so, we are seeing uh, a climate of doing more with less as well. So. Um, that is perhaps worrying as well if we look at the flip side of that what do we mean by uh, the phrase getting uh, more doing more doing more with less and if we dig into that we can actually see maybe uh, what are we talking about are we talking about 
um, doing more with the same level of existing resource that we've got? Are we giving people greater workloads, more demanding workloads? Uh, are we asking them to work extended uh, shift patterns, longer working hours, uh, providing people with fewer resources? Um, so it's perhaps a little bit of a, um, a disguised message really in, in the excessive pressures uh, and lack of resource that we're starting to provide certain workforces when we use the phrase doing more with less. Uh, and in that sense, we could perhaps discuss, you know, are we sort of starting to unconsciously gamble with health and safety? Uh, if we are giving people fewer resources, demanding, you know, higher workloads and so on, are we kind of starting to get into the realms of uh, spinning the roulette wheel with, uh, with health and safety? In relation to some of those goal conflicts, uh, we also seem to be more comfortable with um, with some of the grey areas of work, and I just sort of use a sort of personal example of some of that grey area in some of the life decisions that that we make. So I'm not going to use anything too provocative, um, but I thought I'd use this example on some of the ways we might see binary decisions, when actually they are grey decisions, and there are areas which are um, a little bit more difficult to judge as right or wrong. So what I've got here is. Um, a set of temporary traffic lights over in the UK. Uh, and I'm sure we've all been faced with this, uh, this view in front of us and uh, had to make a decision after a while. So the dilemma is, um, how long do you wait at the red lights at these sort of temporary traffic lights? Uh, now we know the rule, we know the rule is to, um, when the right light is red, we stay put, um, but we tend to start to move into adaptive behavior in this kind of situation, particularly after waiting uh, maybe a, a five, 10 minutes. Uh, interesting when I pose this or when I used to pose this at live audiences, some people might suggest they'd wait two or three minutes before putting their foot down and starting to get through. So the judgment I think will be very individual, different for all of us. But what we tend to see is there's a pattern that there comes a point, maybe that's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, there comes a point where most people will have made the decision to progress through the red light and, uh, and get to their destination, whether that be home or to work or wherever it may be. Um, so what we see is that when we ask people, you know, what, why, why is that? Why do you think it's okay to break the rule? It's all the same sorts of reasons. Maybe someone else jumps, you, you jumps the gun, gets around you and, and passes you and then you just follow them through. Uh, maybe it's time pressure. Uh, maybe it's that you know better that you feel quite comf uh, confident and comfortable in doing that, that you're more careful than others. Lots of uh, reasons, rationale as to why you might do that. Uh, and again, we all we would all succumb to that sort of pressure after a period of time. I'm yet to meet somebody put their hand up to say that they would they would wait here for sort of five or six hours at the red light. Most people would ultimately make the judgment that it would be sensible um, to not comply with the rule in this case and uh, and deviate. So, in relation to understanding the problem a little bit more, some going back to some of the basics of human factors really, is that we know there are ways to deal with this kind of issue. And we know that feedback is really important when it comes to human behavior in many circumstances. Uh, and this is a, a similar sort of picture. This is in, in France where they seem to have adopted this more commonly than we have in the UK. So here we can see feedback. We've got at the bottom of the traffic lights, we've got a countdown timer. So at the bottom there, you can probably see, I think it says one minute 38. So that's counting down. Uh, so when that gets to zero, I know the light's going to change and I'm on my way again. So uh, if that gets to zero, it's still on red. I'll probably be pretty confident there is a problem and it's uh, maybe worth me carefully uh, navigating my way around. But, uh, but this kind of feedback uh, enables us to, to be more compliant with that particular rule. Um, and this is applicable to all aspects of work. Again, it's a message that's been really emphasised over the last few days, uh, but really inviting that input. If we've got a problem, like people jumping traffic lights, temporary lights, understanding why is that the case? Um, and it, when I say inviting that input, I mean actually getting out there and asking people, not being passive and waiting for people to tell us about it. So being curious, uh, genuinely listening as well. So that's um, probably, can't emphasize that enough, genuinely listening, not just sort of being present while someone's talking, but actually being receptive to that information and wanting to fix some of the problems and causes or causal factors that, uh, that link to that. And also seeing error, as again mentioned throughout the last few days, seeing error as a symptom and not the cause. Um, I think really important as well is that um, if nobody's flagging, flagging issues, that doesn't mean there aren't any issues. Uh, usually it's more of a, that in itself is usually a deeper sign, a deeper signal that there are problems that maybe people are not comfortable in, 
in raising those challenges and problems and the adaptations that they're having to make to get the job done because uh, i'm sure as most of you will uh, experience in your work there are things that you you do adaptations you make to get the job done on a day-to-day -day basis um, so yeah linking back to the sort of new views and perspectives um i guess just to cover from a health and safety executive point of view there is that need obviously always to be legally compliant um, safety science, I think, gives us that umbrella term that we can capture those multiple new view perspectives. Uh, and as long as they're bringing value in some way, bringing us some kind of learning and bringing an evidence base, I don't see any, any issue with using any of those new view terms that are out there at the moment. Uh, much of them, I think, ultimately do build on the discipline of human factors. A lot of them are related to the uh, human factors topics, to uh, psychology as well. A lot of um, uh, human factors specialists emerged from uh, the discipline of psychology as well. I think one of the challenges we face with some of these new views is that they've often become quite individual, quite branded, uh, and we can end up with these sort of tribal, polarised, in-group, out-group views. And I think um, it's wise to try and ignore some of those sort of rows and arguments and just look for what actually brings value to us trying to uh, improve health and safety in organisations. Uh, perhaps related to that, it's maybe worth, again, mentioning some of the... Um, the language differences that have emerged. If you look at some of the language, I'll just bring up the table I've got here. If you look at some of the language, it has changed and maybe it helps a little bit with um, seeing things from a different perspective. Um, so, you know, maybe a couple of decades ago, we used to talk more about active failures and latent conditions, whereas now we talk more about the sharp end and the blunt end. We used to talk about a few decades ago, living in an ivory towel, whereas now we talk about work as imagined, work as done. Uh, we used to use the expression of putting yourself in someone else's shoes and now we talk about local rationality. So you can see that a lot of the language is changing, um, but the concepts themselves are fairly similar or the same. And it's perhaps worth also adding in there that when we are disputing or um, arguing the differences over some of these terms, that from an academic point of view, this can be quite important sometimes. The concepts themselves and the way they're measured uh, can be quite key. So, for example, if we're talking about psychological safety, that's a, a very specific concept from an academic point of view that we measure in a very specific way. So arguing, you know, do we really need psychological safety is, is, is not really a, an important point as such, because from an academic point of view, it's, it's a useful concept which we measure in a very particular way. Um, so to start to close in on this session, uh, I just wanted to emphasise really some of the points that have been flagged um, away from the sharp end, so the blunt end of the organisation. And I think that's where leadership really comes in and makes a big difference. It really does matter. Uh, and again, that's where from a, a HSE point of view, a lot of the um, focus would be on, on the leadership in the organisation, the, uh, the controlling minds, as we sometimes refer to them in the organisation. So to sum up, I thought I'd introduce just a few leadership traps that I've come across both in our HSE uh, role and also as a consultant role as well. Uh, so some of those are selecting and promoting leaders based on charisma rather than competence. So this is being seen, I guess, quite strongly in an academic sense as well, that uh, leadership um, roles are often filled by those who come across in a very charismatic way. And there is sort of questionable links sometimes in relation to the true competence, especially around health and safety. It's something that isn't necessarily really valued in senior leadership when it comes to um, the health and safety competence and understanding. Not that they need to be, uh, you know, in-depth health and safety professionals, but having at least some degree of understanding is quite critical to make sure that they are um, resourcing things in the right sort of way, that they understand how to sort of deal with some of the problems that they might face as an organisation. Um, forgetting actions speak louder than words as well. So again, platitudes uh, quite common that we have campaigns. Uh, we might talk about improving our culture around here and all these kind of things. But actually, ultimately, if some of the problems are more related to things like the design of work, the workload that people have, the shift patterns they have, then actually it's solving some of those uh, deeper rooted um, contributory factors or causal factors of the issues that, uh, that are going to make the biggest difference. So solving those problems speaks much louder than putting up a big sign about a new health and safety initiative. Uh, the desire to act is a common trap as well. I think that's been picked up in some of the earlier sessions as well. So wanting to be perceived as doing something about a problem which might link to health and safety. 
uh, rather than trying to understand. So rather than being curious about what could be wrong here, let's go and speak to some people about what challenges they have. We want to do some kind of initiative rapidly and feel like we've, we're solving the, the problem that we're faced with. Attracted to simplicity is another common trap that's seen. So uh, oversimplification of data is, is quite common. Uh, so a big preference over quantitative data over qualitative data. Uh, and if you can simplify that into a dashboard of yellow, amber and green for things like risk registers, then that's even better. Uh, but we miss a lot of the important detail when we oversimplify data in that way. And it, it means that we often lack a, a good understanding of um, some of the causal or contributory factors that are leading us to, to having uh, challenges and issues in relation to health and safety performance. Um, collection of data seen as the end itself rather than the means to an end. So um, if you look at industries like the oil and gas industry, lots of collection of um, hazard reporting cards and safety observation cards and these kind of things, uh, but often very little done with those in relation to an analysing them or using them in any kind of meaningful way. Um, so that, yeah, being attracted by collecting the data or collecting data rather than actually doing anything with it. Not having time to learn as well. So whether that be from a personal level, so I used to do um, a lot of work, still do on, on leadership development and uh, mentoring and coaching. Um, and there can often be a big split in leadership perceptions here. Some will see, you know, that continual professional development is really important and see it key to learn more about health and safety. Others just not seeing that as important to their job role. Um, things like investment in skill sets in the right areas of the business as well. So if we're going to learn, uh, whilst proactive learning proactively um, from things that go well has, has been talked about, also learning from incidents, things that go wrong, but we need to make sure if we're going to do that, um, that we are also investing the right uh, competencies, the right people into doing that as well. And Ivan's talked a little bit about some of the process uh, they've gone through to, um, to learn better from investigations um, and treating them as learning experiences, learning opportunities. Uh, rather than again seeing them as a you know we, we do an investigation we produce a report we put that report on the shelf which obviously isn't the same as learning lots of other avenues that we can uh, learn proactively so methods that we use in human factors things like safety critical task analysis uh, just getting out and about if we're finding a lot of the workforce are suffering from things like fatigue high workload stress there are design issues in relation to errors that they're making because of design uh, that kind of just informal data collection is going to add a lot of value to us um, learning and improving as well. Yeah, so understanding those adaptations that workers are making to uh, to get the job done and to enable safety to happen. Uh, another key one that we see really frequently is uh, focusing purely on safety and or, or more so on safety and neglecting the health side, including mental health uh, in the workplace. So. When we talk about health and safety, health is often a, a silent part of health and safety. So is there enough emphasis going on to the health side of, uh, of people's work? Are they exposed to um, hazards which uh, might harm lungs? Are they exposed to psychosocial factors which might harm them to some extent? Uh, so are we, are we considering that wider, um, wider focus on, on hazards? Uh, Treating ambiguity in grey areas as a bit of a friend is also a, a common trap. So I guess with the traffic light example highlighted that that's quite a grey area. And it seemed to be either deliberately or, um, or by accident, we seem to quite, um, or, or we seem to fall back on having that, those areas of grey uh, within organisations. And it, it does give us this sort of satisfaction of being able to blame things on non-compliance if things go wrong. Um, but also blame people for not using their common sense as well. So if, if there's a rule and following that rule achieves the right outcome, then I can say somebody's non-compliant. If following that rule in a given situation um, results in a bad outcome, then I can say, well, you should have just followed your common sense. You should, you should have applied your common sense. That probably links back a little bit to some of the comments that I've made in one of the earlier presentations as well. So um, really making sure that we move away from that ambiguity and gray that we create in the workplace. Uh, another trap here is putting distance between the issue and the organisation. So, um, yeah, blaming things on worker error rather than ex things like excessive workload, uh, demanding unacceptable uh, volumes of work to be done, design issues and so on. So it's a much, uh, much more favourable um, solution or um, 
root cause, if you want to call it that, to blame it on worker error rather than the real underlying factors that have contributed to those errors occurring, the sort of symptoms of um, that are deeper down within the organisation. So putting that distance between the organisation and the, uh, the leadership and management is, is quite common. Emphasis on financial performance, I've already touched on to some extent. Um, yeah, it's, it's safety only of interest when we have something go wrong. Uh, it seems to be that way. So when we look at how leadership are measured in relation to safety performance, it does usually only become a concern when something goes wrong. So it's no wonder really that blame is the preference for dealing with that. And I think this is where I have a slight issue with one of the HOP principles, so the human and organisational performance principles, which I think goes something along the lines of blame achieves nothing. Now, actually, if we look at the local rationality of, of leadership here, what we can see is that perhaps blame does actually achieve something from the mindset of um, a leader, the controlling mind of an organisation. Blame does actually achieve something. It enables you to scapegoat uh, an individual for a particular uh, incident or wrongdoing and sort of move that, uh, that problem away from the organisation to an individual. Uh, uh, only got a few more to go here, but uh, being seen to having to be right all the, all the time as a leader in an organisation, so lacking humility. Uh, so rather than, rec rather than recognising that leaders do make mistakes and that if leaders make mistakes, that they can be amplified quite significantly across an organisation as well. So, um, you know, if we cut budgets in the wrong areas of the business, if we, um, if we don't take the time and effort to design tasks properly or provide people with the right equipment, uh, then those mistakes further up the chain at the sort of blunt end of the organisation can really be amplified for, uh, throughout the rest of the organisation. And finally, just to touch on something which, which is achieve, uh, receiving a lot more attention now is that of toxic positivity, uh, which again links into a lot of human factors principles and hot principles around being receptive only to the good news within organisations. So uh, this is when um, we sort of reject any critique or negativity from the workforce and we're only really receptive to hearing the good news from across the organisation. And that can actually inhibit people coming forward with the challenges that they're, they're experiencing and the solutions that might go along with solving some of those problems. Uh, and that, that links into a, this little concept as well of um, a demand for positivity, an upward demand for positivity. So as we go through hierarchies in organisations, we often see that messages become more and more positive the further they get up the chain within an organisation. And perhaps an important distinction to, re, uh, to raise here is that between optimism and positivity. So we can be um, critical but optimistic, which is quite different to just being positive. Uh, so to, to bring this um, presentation to a close, uh, just to touch on a, a few key reflection questions that I think are of value um, to any organisation. Uh, so the first is to think about what is your risk profile. This is a question that um, from a senior management, from a leadership level in many organisations that uh, uh, management boards really struggle to answer. So really have difficulty in explaining the risk profile. Uh, and then moving on from that, often struggle to explain what they're prioritising and why they're prioritising uh, those particular areas. So what data are they collecting? Uh, from a, in a proactive and a reactive sense to prioritise the right things to uh, manage risk as effectively as possible. Uh, yeah, and, and applying the alert principles to that. So what, what's being done to manage risks to an alert, uh, alert level. So some key takeaways, listening and learning makes a big difference. Um, sometimes the solutions can be cheap and quite simple. Uh, sometimes that's that's not the case and it, it's uh, a matter of investing uh, more money but this is an example uh, from a recent experience I had um, about a year ago I was knocked off my bike and uh, detached the ligament in my uh, my thumb I went into hospital and some of you probably heard about uh, an error type which we call the right action on the wrong object so the right thing is done but on the wrong object that could be a piece of equipment or in the medical setting we see this happen a lot with surgery so people having things like the wrong the right operation but are the wrong part of their body they might that might be the removal of um uh, tissue or an organ or something like that so this was um me being prepped for an operation to reattach the ligaments and just a real simple solution uh, drawing a big arrow on uh, on my arm so this is the the hand that the operation is required on as well so we see this for a lot of surgery now uh, just a, a marker pen used to highlight 
um, where the operation needs to take place to reduce that type of error occurring. So it's the sort of thing that if we listen to the workforce and the types of errors that are made, we can also come up with some really simple solutions to solve those problems. Uh, another one which I'm sure you've all seen as well is, uh, is this one in a lot of um, uh, email um, programs. So you might send an email, or be writing an email and press the send button. You've probably used the word attachment or a synonym there and you get this little warning to say, um, have you forgot to attach it? Um, do you want to send anyway and so on? So again, really simple solutions sometimes to, to reduce those sorts of errors. Uh, yeah, so investing significantly more time in understanding work, both the good and the bad. And I think it was uh, probably a bit of a cliche to use Albert Einstein quotes, but I think it was Albert Einstein who uh, was famous for the quotes along the lines of, if I've got an hour to solve or to come up with a solution to a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes understanding the problem and five minutes coming up with a solution. So thinking about how much time do we invest in actually trying to understand the problems and challenges versus how much time do we then invest in coming up with the solutions. So I would advise, and I think uh, many of the speakers maybe over the last few days would as well, is trying to understand the challenges and problems is, is really, really important. Um, yeah, and prioritizing some of that effort and resources as well. We've only got finite resources if we are applying a lot of principles, we've not got uh, endless supplies of money, endless supplies of time. We really do have to focus on where we're putting the energy and effort into understanding problems and solving some of those problems. Uh, and this is where I see in some organizations maybe focusing on the wrong things and putting energy and effort into the wrong things. So uh, the amount of energy and effort I've seen, for example, in the oil and gas industry go into um, campaigns about reverse parking or making sure people put lids on coffee cups versus making sure that um, production teams or drilling teams are, are fully competent for the jobs that they're doing. Um, and there's a real sort of disparity between effort going into the, the right and wrong areas in some cases. So I think that brings me to a close. Um, yeah, I think we've probably got some uh, opportunity for questions coming up as well, but uh, do feel free to get in touch as well. Thanks, Richie. I think I, I probably spoke at 100 miles an hour there, but uh, <laughs> hopefully that was okay. No problem at all. Could you, could you do a quick favour? Could you um, stop sharing screen? Yeah, that'd be, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, got it. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you, Ed. Um, that was a really thoughtful presentation. Um, really pleased to see the statement in there that error is a symptom, not a cause. Also, the articulation of leadership traps was useful to hear. So thank you. So we have finally now completed all of the presentations for, for today and indeed the, the conference, um, but we will again finish with a panel Q&A session. Uh, so thank you for submitting your questions throughout the afternoon. There's some really great ones in there. So I look forward to hearing the, the, the panel, uh, how the panel respond to those. To help facilitate the session, James has grouped similar questions together. Uh, and for the benefit of the panel, we would identify whether those questions are aimed at a specific speaker. For the more um, generic questions, we will open it up to all of the panelists. So if they, if they wish to answer, they, they can do so. For the audience, um, please feel free to use the chat function again, um, but more to make comments uh, you know, based on what the panel um, say and how, how the discussion goes. Um, but please use the Q&A facility specifically um, for, for, for questions where you want to direct them to the panel. So James will now take you through the Q&A. Um, so if the panelists could please uh, share your videos. Thank you. Oh. Wait for everyone to join us. I'll start off with a, uh, <clears throat> a few in order of appearance. Uh, and then we'll uh, generalize uh, after that. Um, okay, we're uh, starting uh, with James uh, and Sean at the start. Uh, brilliant presentation initiative, initiative, James. And I believe your lead in this direction will discover many patterns not yet understood by industry and academics. 
Did you perform any inter-rater reliability training with the lit observers that did the flight observations? And what uh, did you find worked well to get the observations more reliable across the observers? Great question. Um, I want to know who that's from. You didn't tell me, James. Uh, yeah, we have done in a related reliability three different times. We've taken three deliberate um, uh, looks at inter-rater reliability, easy for me to say. Um, and they've all been, uh, the, the results have all come back. Quite honestly, they were more aligned than we thought they would be. In the beginning, our goal was to, we did training. We would um, develop, usually I would develop a scenario and write a scenario. We would give it to all the, the observers and have them all code it. And then we would, you know, have, I guess, an approved solution or an, a solution. We just see how close they all were in their rating or coding of the, of the, the, the exact same words of an event. Um, that's not perfect, um, but it's as close as we could get in the beginning. But what we found as time went on was actually it was better. <laughs> our, our rate of reliability got significantly better over time as our coding got better. And our last version of coding, we did a major rework of the coding in 2020, uh, the second half of 2020, as we'd had enough data and we had a chance to go through it. And as we developed those codes much more accurately, and like I, I, I said, we're at least on the 12th version of our language and our coding. Um, as we've developed that, every, every version's got a little better. And this last version is very good. We just trained some brand new observers here in January of 2021. Um, we brought in a handful of brand new observers off the street and trained them just in a couple days. And their um, standardization was, we were amazed. And partially because the codes make more sense and they're easier to apply now. So that was, um, that was good news. And, and so we have done it and we're happy with the results. We actually had some academics help us with that initially. And now we know how to do it. So we do it ourselves. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another one, uh, for the first time in 20 years of working in flight safety, I heard that the Captain PF and FOPM, uh, pilot flying, pilot monitoring, combinations creates the best resistance. So far, I came across events on all continents and in all cultures that an FO as PM didn't dare or didn't manage to prevent the captain doing something stupid or following an unstable plan or unsuitable plan rather. The question is, does the does AA have a special FO training addressing this, or are you uh, are your captains especially well CRM trained? Um, we do not have specific PM training yet, but that will certainly be a byproduct of all the work we're doing today. It's one of our goals is to we need to understand it better before we even tell training you know, what we really need to bring the data to training and explain to them what it says, what the data does say, what it doesn't say, and then we'll probably jointly try to develop some training. So we do not have specific PM training. I remember years ago, oh, I don't, maybe seven years ago, we did a, um, we did a conference at American Airlines and we had all the major U.S. airlines there, including the FAA in, um, the regulator was there and the regulator stood in front of us and said, Right now, with all these air, at least 20 major US airlines in this room, uh, we just happened to host it at American. And the regulator asked, he said, right now in the simulator, if the captain shot an unstable approach and, and violated your unstable approach criteria, and the first officer sat through it and clearly saw it, but did not send the captain around and let the captain land out of it. Um, violating your your procedure, every airline at that time had a procedure that the PM should have called the go around. Um, how many airlines would not only take the captain out, but also take out the PM? And only one airline in that room raised their hand back then, saying the PM would probably um, have an opportunity to redo it. Also, uh, the entire check ride. Um, because they didn't do their duty. But I can tell you my airline at the time did not raise their hand. Now, I think today we're coming along a little bit better with that. I think airlines would, um, uh, more and more airlines, I think American Airlines, we probably would would have a discussion with the PM about that. But we struggle with this greatly. This is a psychology. There's a lot of stuff going on in the PM and why the PM doesn't choose to speak up. Um, it's way It's way more than something as simple as even as, you know, we're just trying to learn more about it with the lit 
um, approach right now. Like I said, uh, LOSA leadership is also telling us something similar. Um, uh, we capture EBT markers, EBT, um, uh, I guess countermeasures, EBT competencies in our LOSA program. And we're, we're getting deep into that data to see if we can learn more about why our crews, why our PMs are not always being good monitors and not doing their job as monitor. And it's not always the FO. There's many times where the captain sits through the, the FO's thing. And, and that's very, it's very interesting to us. We, we, nobody really understands it anecdotally. I think we all know it. We've all done it as pilots that are pilots and been like, I've been there. I've sat through something I shouldn't have. But we don't understand for sure why. And, and we really need to figure it out because I think it could be the next incremental step if we could make the PM's role actually much more effective in, in what they do. Thanks for that. Could, could I add something to that conversation? Oh, please do. Um, there's an interesting uh, fellow that you guys might be familiar with who flew for Kimber Airlines while he was a professor at Lind University. And of course, uh, this, this individual is Sidney Decker. And he was a co-pilot on a flight going into a small airport in uh, northern Denmark. And the same thing happened to him. He flew with a guy that he described as the gorilla. And uh, he did an unstable approach that he felt was very dangerous and didn't speak up. So you're quite right. This is a really, really complex issue. Uh, it's got a lot of deep nuances, deep, deep cultural nuances, deep... Uh, Financial, lots of different influences on the pilots to not speak up. This idea of upward voice and creating that space is really important. And even Sydney, one of the proponents of this entire idea, couldn't speak up in that role and it wasn't even his primary livelihood. So worth thinking about. Uh, right, um, Adam, Val, um, I see Val's being joined by a team from CAFE, so we get a bit more perspective on this as well. Thanks very much for that, guys. Um, okay, I'll start off with uh, this one here. Would it be possible to share the flight ops safety philosophy full document with the group? Um, I think uh, it's a great starting point to set the tone. I think that'll be one for the existing CAFE team. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um... Yeah, James, no problem at all. And you know, we're only too happy to share it with the group. Um, you know, it, it, it was a project that took, you know, something like a year to develop. Um, and, and Adam, Adam uh, obviously was, was spearheading that when he was with us. Um, it, what's interesting about that philosophy is, that, is the language that's in it. Um, and uh, we now drive, you know, the four Ps, philosophy, policy, procedure and practice. So from that philosophy, we're now obviously developing um, policy and procedure around, you know, how, how, we, how we view, um, you know, the concept of accountability. Um, you know, accountability is, is, is problematic in our industry um, because traditionally we've used a retributive approach on, uh, you know, as, as Sydney would call it, uh, Ivan, you know, shades of retribution uh, on, on, on performance. Um, because it's you know it's assigned to individual blame as where if you look at a forward forward moving accountability um, you, you need to focus on um, on innovative accountability and, and how how learning can drive drive the um, uh, you know drive that accountability and, and improve performance in the organisation um, so yeah we, you know um, we're only too happy to share that. Great, thanks. Um, on that note, I think we'll say that uh, we'll put that on our website that went with this uh, conference. There's already some resource on there that anything we can get from uh, presenters yesterday and today we'll share, obviously, and also get um, the recordings of this uh, both days today. Uh, all right, just moving on. Um, Adam and Val, thanks. Just wondering if you had a particular software to help with the qualitative analysis that you discussed, e.g. the word bubbles. Oh, a bit short of sound, Val. How's that? Yeah. There, there are various online tools you can use, so um, nothing specific but uh, there's lots out there. So um, it depends what you want to do and how much you, uh, you want to get involved in it. 
Right. Thanks. Um, is there a, a systems thinking training course that you might recommend uh, to get the good fundamentals for applying it to the world of aviation? I think um, I've not attended it myself, but I would probably bet my bottom dollar that Stephen Schrock's uh, systems thinking course that he runs through Eurocontrol would be a, a good place to start. Excellent. I think he mentioned that yesterday. Um, so you, you talked about the also the um, differences in building um, specific operations for uh, different airlines, um, but you, you feel there's enough commonality to make uh, more collaboration worthwhile in this area. Definitely. I mean, we obviously have a, a lot of crossover because we're working with similar ideas from the same foundation. So listening to James's presentation today rang a lot of bells and um, the talks yesterday. So I think we're all going in the same direction, just finding our own paths. Yeah, I, I think I would just add to that. Um, the aviation industry is really good at sharing data. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that sharing raw data is necessarily the, the way forward because actually people's data is incredibly contextual. Um, so actually what we should be sharing is lessons learned from the data um, and, and what we can kind of, the, the issues or the challenges that we can distill from it, both from a negative and a positive perspective. So if we're identifying, as James has, um, the resilience potential differences between pilot flying and pilot monitoring, then he can share that learning, but doesn't necessarily mean he needs to share the raw data um, which is typically what a lot of the focus is on um, in the aviation industry. Okay, thanks. I can add, James, I can add a little bit of context to that. What, what, what's really interesting is when you listen to Quasi you know, talk about um, the pilot monitoring role, um, they used, you know, they used their process, which has the same foundation as ours. And, and actually, in fact, through our LR process, we're finding the same, the same, the same issue. Um, you know, we, we're kind of wondering why the, 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 the PM is the high speed cheerleader sometimes, you know, when they should really be, you know, focusing on, on, on the task at hand. So it, it's quite interesting to listen to two, two uh, and, and American, American and, and, and ourselves had these conversations, oh, James, how long ago now? Two years, a year, year and a half, I think. You know, and it's interesting that if we we're on the same principles, um, you know, Eric's sort of resilience principles, yet we're finding with with slightly different processes where we're finding almost similar themes i guess if you if you want to look at that way so it, it's been a bit of an interesting journey so i think whilst if you stick to the principles um of of uh you know like like ed ed was, was talking about some of the principles the, the the results how you go about it the results seem to be uh, producing similar outcomes Okay. I think that's a really good point, Pete, if you don't mind me just chipping in finally there. The um, context is king, and that, I think that's what's going to allow us to, to have this, this new view or look at safety differently. So we've shared data uh, for a long time, and, and there's an awful, a, a, an awful lot we can get from that data. But now by sharing the lessons learned from the context, uh, and also some of the other well-being uh, initiatives that we're putting in place, all of them feed this new view. And I think that's what we need to share and we can share. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so how uh, easy was it um, to get buy-in for senior management changing over to the uh, operational learning review? Um, <laughs> because obviously there's a lot I can take... around that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I must admit initially it was, we um, we're very fortunate at, at Cathay that we have uh, the, especially on the fly ops management side, some you know really keen people at the top who really wanted this to happen, really put, you know, pushed for it to work. They then helped us um, sell it to the to the more yeah you know, the, the the more corporate commercial side. And now the value is being seen, and we're being asked to roll this process out. The OLR process is now being asked to be rolled out to engineering, into the cabin. So all of the other safety critical areas have seen the value of, of this and, and are asking for it to be rolled out there as well. So um, we were lucky at the start. We had we had good support, and now it's seen, you know, the value is seen across the whole system. So okay. thanks for that. Um, I'll move on to Ivan. Um, 
is a question. Uh, there seems to be individual personality factors connected to certain safety behaviors. Is this something that should be accounted for during selection recruitment? Is personality a recruitment concept that is demonized in the industry? Does it come from the assumption that personality is not something we can develop or change? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, going through Navy flight school, if you didn't make it through Navy flight school, they actually took your, your medical record and stamped NAA on the front of it, which meant non, not aeronautically adaptable. So clearly the Navy has a, a perspective on this that may or may not agree with some of the rest of us. Um, there are th some things, some qualities, having said that there are some qualities that people have that are strengths in um, a flight environment that may not be learned skills. They may be the qualities of, um, they may be the qualities that are intrinsic to that individual. However, having said that, um, I will say that organizations can change those things. So to answer the question, I'll answer the question with a brief story. Uh, my first flight in the Coast Guard, first operational flight in the Falcon Jet was, was with a very domineering aircraft commander. He was also on the ground, my boss, my supervisor. So I was an admin officer and he was the head of administration for this particular air station. So he's my boss on the ground and now he's my aircraft commander in the air. And we took off, oil pressure dropped to zero in the number one engine. And I grabbed the throttle expecting him to go through the procedure, shut down the engine. And he said, don't tell me what to do. So I thought, well, this is my first operational flight, what will I do? So I pulled out the manual and he said, don't start quoting me from that book either. Now that was an individual who probably needed a little bit of an attitude adjustment because that was an opportunity to teach a young co-pilot that we should look for secondaries before we take an action. So look for an increase in oil temperature, something like that. That's not where we went and we didn't go to the procedure either. He turned me into gear up, shut up boy. And that's what I was for the rest of the flight. But the Forest Service, I mean, the, the Coast Guard then approached this the, the problem through crew resource management. And crew resource management started to understand the importance of cognitive diversity and bringing more eyes to bear, and that these become training opportunities for senior aircraft commanders. So, can you change that behavior if you set the circumstances up, the conditions up, where the system of rewards rewards the behaviors that you like? Yes. And I emphasize the reward side because I don't think that there's anything that you could have done to this particular individual to punish him. That wouldn't have happened. Maybe take away his wings, but that's never gonna happen for that kind of an operation. So the situation that we're in turns into an influence-based thing that is based around those rewards. So yes, look at the conditions. And as James Reason said, you can't change the human condition, but you can change the conditions under which humans work. And as you change those conditions, that shapes the behaviors that you want. So that would be my best answer. Yeah, yeah could probably add a little bit to that as well, James, just to say that um, I think we have to be a bit careful. I, I'm not sure if the question was aimed at using like, psychometrics to help uh, sort of recruit people who are safer. Um, and I think there's a danger to that because, well, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that you potentially reduce the diversity of you know the thinking that you have in the workforce uh, but the second one there is that just because you might sort of have a certain trait doesn't mean you're going to behave in that particular way in a certain context so you know i might have a pr propensity for risk taking but if i'm a pilot doesn't mean i'm going to be a dangerous pilot as such so you've got to apply quite a lot of caution i think in relation to thinking that you can use personality assessments as a way of selecting safer people as so yeah i'd say there's got to be a lot of caution with that yeah i agree and if you think about the kind of pilots that we hire to certain jobs flying low level over forest fires at 125 feet supposedly above the trees um that requires somebody who's uh, willing to take a few risks so yeah sure um, okay, here we go. Um, yesterday, the subject of after action reviews or debriefs came up uh, and again today. Um, I understand you have a well thought through process of that. Uh, have you, what uh, benefits have you seen from that where they've been implemented? This is back to me again, James? Yeah, please, thanks. Yeah. So this idea of after action reviews is, is really important. It's also, um, 
it's also dependent upon the willingness of the individual to provide information. It's, it's like any other situation where you're expecting somebody to speak truth to power. Um, you either have to create an environment where there is no rank structure, there is no hierarchy, and everybody's at a level playing field. Of course, we can say that, and we say it easily, but actually doing it is something else again. Back to my little story about the boss that I'm flying with, right? I, I might get away with it in the airplane, but there might be some retribution when I get back on the ground and my boss holds me accountable to his standard of operation. So when we start to think about this idea of, of after action reviews, it is not a simple uh, linear process. It is a nonlinear process that is very complex, very dependent upon the culture of the organization and the ability of people to put others at ease so the person that I would point you to for this is Amy Edmondson and her work around teaming and the idea of psychological safety. But I'd also suggest that you take a look at Scott Page's work. Scott Page is really quite interesting. He's a guy that started out looking at complexity as uh, a means to understand how to create um, um, machine thinking. And where he moved to was this idea of cognitive diversity. And he's got quite a few really nice videos out on this idea of cognitive diversity and creating that important aspect inside organizations. So I know I'm being a little bit long-winded about this because it's not an easy thing to do. But once you do create that environment where people can speak up and speak truth to power, the after action review can be an, a remarkably important tool. And then the next thing that I would suggest about that is that you don't have to globalize that information. That could be local for that particular crew and they could learn what they need to learn from that particular mission and only share the aspects of it that do apply to the entire fleet of operations. And giving them that latitude where they don't have to report out on everything that they talked about is kind of an important aspect to, again, foster the environment where these dialogues can take place. Did that get it? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, just a, a quick follow-up question for me. The, um, do you think we look too much at stamping out variation and then have problems with uh, diversity of thought or diversity of operation. Absolutely. So can't go from one local beat to another. Kind of. Absolutely. So we, we talk about it. We have a lot of phraseology around this. We categorize things a lot as human beings. And I'm not sure the categorization really leads anywhere positive in terms of learning. But the idea that you bring out here is if we have uniformity within the ranks, when we start to talk within the ranks, are we getting a different perspective from people? So the more we push toward uniformity, the less we get diverse feedback. So we need to think about that. And work here that I would point to is the work of Ruben McDaniel, who's sadly since passed, but his idea of management principles around this idea of complex adaptive systems, really, really useful. And his viewpoint on uniformity, he talked to the Forest Service and said, you guys all look alike. You're all dirty, you're all male, and you're all given the same answers. So when you face a situation that's novel, where do you go? Yeah. Right. Thanks. So. Uh, last one. Um, all the presentations are very good, but Ivan's US forestry presentation is very close to my heart. 10 deaths in 10 years is staggeringly high when considering the low flying hours forestry service fly a year. My question is, why do organizations take so long to realize they have a problem? The length it takes to correct, I can understand. So Yanni, this is a great question. And first, let me, let me correct one thing. It was 25 deaths in the first 10 years in aviation alone. Uh, so we had a lot. Um, your question is really interesting. So when we start to think about why organizations take so long to realize that they have a problem, part of it is time to a desire that all human beings have for certainty. So an organization that has developed over the years and reacted to accidents over the years has created a menu of rules, regulations, policies, and procedures that don't necessarily apply to every situation. But what they do apply to are the fatalities that the organization has felt so far. And that organizational memory keeps them grounded in those rules, regulations, policies, and procedures, regardless of whether they are applicable or not. So basically we kind of fall in love with our own answers to, to our complex problems. And most of our, our answers, some people call them knee-jerk reactions, most of our answers are simple answers to complex issues. 
but we don't want to give those up because we know that that would have prevented the accident that just happened or the one that happened five years ago. So we can't give that up just in case that same accident happened again. So a big part of what you have to do is educate leadership to realize that in complex systems, that accident will never happen again. That it's so complex, the environment is so complex and the variability, normal systems variability, normal human variability, that's the big issue, but they're not gonna combine in exactly the same way in the future. So many of the interventions that you developed, you have to say goodbye to. And it's really hard for them to do that because they're unwitting themselves from this idea of control. And that is a very difficult thing for leadership to do. It takes quite a bit of dialogue. It takes quite a bit of questioning them, questioning their assumptions. It's not an easy thing to do. That's why it takes so long. Did that answer your question, Yanni, I hope? Right, thanks for that. Right. Um, Catherine, I'll uh, move on to you now. If that's all right, we'll go straight in with a, a uh, procedural question. How far is ICAO in integrating uh, safety two in Annex 19 and DOCS uh, 9859. So the, the challenge that ICAO has um, with all these concepts is how, how they introduce it because it's looking to support um, 194 member states who are all at very different levels of, um, le of understanding and also with other different supporting legal and regulatory environments. So these things are being introduced. Um, it, it may be in a slower time, which is why the Human Performance Manual is one of those aspects where these things can be discussed in a way that introduces the subject, but not being in Annex 19. So it's not that it drives uh, compliance with, seem to be compliance with these new approaches when states aren't ready to take them forward. So it, it's an ongoing discussion. The, SM, the, the ICAO SMP safety management panel um, discuss all these different aspects and what people want to put in. But from an ICAO perspective, we have to be careful. It's a journey for everybody. Uh, it's not just a journey for those who know this and want to um, you know, really support and share. Yep, we can do that as states. Um, and support that understanding, but it, it's a it's a bigger and longer journey. So um, it'll take some more time as we look to see how we can support states. But the IKEA Human Performance Manual is that first step. So in, in introducing states to those concepts when they may be very uh, traditionally rule bound, especially culturally as well. Thanks for that. Um, how do the CAA approach system design within airlines? Usually they are focused on performance assessments instead of design assessments. Are there requirements enforcing safe design of systems? So, um, um, and are we looking just at, at, a, at an airline? That's quite a, quite a broad question. Yeah, sure. so, <laughs> um, so I think that's why, again, the manual is looking to support us uh, looking at human centered design, but also looking to ask the questions at oversight. So we've talked about concept, um, the importance of context throughout these couple of days. And I think that's the conversations that we have around how the system's designed, asking those questions about your operational context, not just that generic application of the regulation, but asking the demonstration of the context against um, how an organization is developing its various systems. Right, thanks for that. Um, given that today we have seen, especially from the US, a move away from punishments towards learning and how and why pilots acted as they did, does the regulator plan to encourage uh, our airlines, uh, certainly in this country, uh, to adopt this uh, more positive, less punitive approach? Um, okay, I'll go on this one. I think Ed, Ed will probably be, want to want to add to that as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we encourage, promote um, peer to peer learning, peer to peer sh sharing of um, experiences um, uh, and, and support those other aspects. Now, um, 
we, we actively seek to work with our stakeholder groups to share best practice, to understand what organizations are doing within their own from an organizational peer to peer support, not just a, from an individual basis, but getting organizations to, to demonstrate their best practice and if you like, uh, pull people into, into those behaviors, uh, working together on that. So I think that's, that's what we're looking to, uh, to promote. Um, Ed, do you have anything more to add? Uh, yeah, I guess I can add, I guess there is a difference obviously between say an HSE and our responsibilities and duties. Um, I think the key thing to bear in mind from where we come from as HSE is that um, we are here to enforce the law around health and safety, the Health and Safety at Work Act and other legislation. Um, so I guess there's limited ability to sort of say, well, we're not going to hold companies accountable anymore or the controlling mind or the directors and so on. So, um, yeah, I probably can't speak as, um, as, as well as a, uh, a regulatory colleague could do, but we have limited influence about sort of saying, right, we're not going to pursue accountability and director's duties and all those sorts of things anymore. So, yeah, if you think of us as here to enforce the law, if we were going to make any changes, we'd have to be looking at how society changed the law ultimately in relation to health and safety. If that, I'm not sure that helps or just sort of makes things more complicated. Yeah, and just to add to that, of course, you know, our primary goal is to protect the public, whether they fly or whether they don't. So that is always our goal. We're all on the same playing field. We're in different pit places and we need to that's the thing with systems thinking we really need to understand the view from each other's seats to work together to drive that forward but our primary object objective as as the CAA is to protect the public whether they fly or, or whether they don't yeah fair enough um this is probably both again um also how can regulators make use of independent third parties like the Flight Safety Foundation to act as honest broker in data arrange aggregation of risk identification. So we are um, a member of the Flight Safety Foundation and we do work with them. We're on several committees uh, working with the Flight Safety Foundation uh, and we've had a long history of, of that activity. Um, and it's also things like we're also a member of the UK cross regulatory human factors working group. So as part of that group, we learn and share and challenge each other as well. So all of these collaborative activities can help. Um, with regard to data, it's it's quite a, a challenging piece about how and why you're collecting it in terms of taxonomies um, and finding way, ways forward on that. I know IATA is doing a, a piece of work trying to, to look at how it can aggregate some forms and streams of data. And we need to make sure that when we're, when we're looking at data, again, it's that context piece. Um, and trying to identify those key areas. And I was particularly interested in looking at it from that safety behavior. So I will be talking to uh, both American and Cathay looking at, at how they're collecting their data from a safety behavior perspective so that we can mine our data better because obviously we only get data when something is reportable and we'd like to get more useful information um, in terms of identifying trends and things. So it's about how can we use the information that we do get, bearing in mind that we get it when it has to be reported um, and how we can use that a bit more intuitively against the safety issues that we're seeing running across all of the areas. So not to a specific area. So again, it, it's a journey. We've got a team looking at big data um, we have to be careful that big data just doesn't mean lots of data. So we need to transfer that with those human to human conversations uh, uh, into information that then informs knowledge, whether it's in a specific area or a specific safety issue or within a specific organization. So, so that's what we're, we're looking to do. We're still on that journey, um, making sure we use that data well, but collaborating with others is, is a key area. Thanks for that. Um, this is a Balpa conference. Um, we see that American Airlines obviously has a really close tie up with their unions. Um, does the regulator support that sort of activity in the UK? Obviously, we, uh, we like to play a role as best we can. Um, what are your views on that? 
Uh, did you want me to go first on that one, Catherine? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I mean, um, wherever there's opportunity to collaborate and see and share lessons is, is always seen as a positive from a regulatory point of view, really. Um, yeah, so I mean, if as, as HSE, I mean, if we can sort of support and facilitate, again, it's we see it as the um, you know it's industry, the organisations that are creating risk need to manage that. But if we can facilitate that learning, uh, we would certainly do that as much as we could do. And certainly, any collaboration, whether it be across GB or more broadly, is seen as a real positive, um, both within industry and also outside. As well. I mean, there's lots, so many lessons you, we can learn from other industries as well. I haven't talked a lot about uh, forestry work and so on. I mean, it's different contexts, but almost identical learnings that can be extracted from lots of different sectors as well. So whether it be within aviation or broader than that, I would say is, is certainly a positive and would be seen as such by HSC and, and probably by CAA as well, but Catherine can probably add to that. Yeah, exactly. Learning, learning from other safety critical industries is key, which is why we work with that um, cross-regulatory group and obviously we have to look at the safety um, you know UK airlines go around the world so we have to look broadly and how we collaborate with that so working with ICAO looking at COVID recovery um, methodologies and uh, supporting material so all of those collaborative activities that we have and safety partnerships which we're establishing globally too so you know it, it's it's really key to um, to collaborate with that and bring that information back where you can. And our 3P approach, so looking at what programs of activity we have, um, you know, developing that more robustly into our promotional activities and testing that our promotion lands and could we do it another way and share best practice. Um, and, and again, in that methodology of what type of publication is going to best land? Because as a regulator, we have lots of tools and technology these days allows us to really tailor that to the market we're looking at rather than just putting something out that's a, a dry regulation. So we have more opportunities now to, to share information and best practice and get that feedback in a more informative sense rather than an oversight sense as well. James, can I just add just on the, yeah. this, the question you had about um, kind of unions and companies working together, just yeah. to give a quick perspective from my new industry in, in rail. Um, we actually have a very close working relationship that's been well long established between the, the company and the, the union, the RMT, so much so that um, whenever we carry out risk assessments, we, we involve um, at least two members of the union who you know, represent the frontline workforce to actually provide input. Um, we also have quarterly meetings that involve the union and the local kind of operational managers as well. So yeah. Perhaps within the UK aviation industry, there is potentially scope to, to draw the union members or the u union leaders and reps closer to the, the decision making around operations, because actually what they're able to do, if we talk about normal work and understanding everyday work, the union reps can kind of act as a conduit between the front line and the, and the management to provide that. And I, I often lean on our union reps to say, right, can you collect me some frontline views? because they're probably going to be more efficient at collecting it than I am. Yeah, closing the gap between workers, imagine the workers don't like it. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I'm just going to start on some new, uh, newer questions that have come in. Um, so this is for Cathay team. Is the uh, OLR process followed for all safety FDM related events? And also what's HUFAC model does Cathay use? HUFAC. So um, obviously it's very resource intensive, but we try and, and uh, conduct an OLR for as many events as we possibly can. And also remember, it's not just events. We want to conduct OLRs when nothing's happened. That's, that's the nirvana. You know, yeah. We want to you know, get one of our pilots and say, you know, nothing happened on your flight from New York to Hong Kong. Can we go and talk about it? You know, that, that's the perfect OLR. Um, so, so we try and do it for as many events as we can. And with regards to the human factors analysis methods we use, we are in the process of creating one for the OLR. So we've looked at all or many different uh, analysis tools. Uh, we've got the best of them, I think, and we're trying to uh, see how that works with the OLR to give us the context. But it's mainly about thematic coding and, and then categorization is what we do to, for our analysis. 
right? Um, uh, is there a mechanism that can harvest all big data events out there to produce the necessary rich data that we need to develop the necessary improvement as initiatives in the most cost effective way? Yeah, right on. Yeah, if, if someone's got that answer, please call American Airlines because yeah. we would like it. <laughs> it's not, we haven't found and, one. And yet. Can't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, please call us when you've developed that. We're, we're working with some people to develop it. It's a long, it's a long way away. Every data stream is unique, has its okay. own, uh, you know, problems and issues. It'll be years probably still again before we can figure out how to get it all combined. You know, the, the FAA and MITRE and ASIAS worked on the fusion program in the U.S. That's probably as far along as anyone, but it's still, it's still a real challenge. Um, that's all I can say. But along those lines, I did want to make a real quick point. I'll let um, Peter maybe follow on. Is we we're very interested in American in, in sharing. You've probably heard that we've written the we wrote the paper not for us to share with the with everyone that wants to read it. We're writing the second paper. Um, we want we want the word to get out. And part of the reason why is I. I I need to be able to talk to other people about what we find. Um, and and we've, we've had great discussions with Cathay over the last two years, I guess, really. We've had very regular discussions where they're at. The Singapore folks are coming. We talk with them, other airlines, just to share our experience because we learn so much more by talking about our data and what do we see in it and what do you see in it and what can we each learn from each other. And that's one of our big efforts and, and, and we're really trying hard. I would love, one of my ultimate goals is to make it whatever we do with Safety 2. And it doesn't have to be this coding and this language that American developed. I just want, would think, would like it to be fairly similar so we can all talk about it. And when we're talking about it, we're talking about apples. When we call an apple an apple, everybody knows what an apple is. And then we, we can have great discussions very easily across airlines all over the world. And that would advance, that right there would advance our, our knowledge level and our ability to share and grow and learn from each other so much. And, and I think just that simple thing. So we're making a big push. We're working with the Flight Safety Foundation. American has been for over a year and a half now trying to trying to get something standardized out to the industry so, so that it's out there. And again, I don't care what it looks like. It doesn't have to be our solution. That's not our point. We just want something that everybody could use if they want as a basis so that it's, um, it's, standard. it's more standardized than some other things we've done. And, you know, we've gotten branches of, they're all excellent, but when you look at hop and safety differently and safety two, and resilience engineering right there, we have very, four very similar approaches to the same thing, but all with different vectors, which, which kind of dissipate, in my opinion, the energy. And I would much rather see us try to focus that energy together to whatever the central point is and, and let the group decide what that central point is. It may change over years, but let's try to do that rather than, than kind of everyone going in their own, their own direction. And then at the end of the day, we ch we're challenged with discussing it. Sorry to get on my soapbox a little. I usually put that in my presentation. I didn't want to get that to kick the morning off this morning, but uh, I've heard and seen some comments on that. Uh, might be worth adding, James. Well, I think um, some colleagues have, have been working on that sort of side of the big data element and processing that and extracting lessons. And I, I don't know whether it's a, a, a true thing or maybe it's just used as a bit of a joke in the big data world, but um, uh, an example was given of looking into incidents on, on vessels on, in the maritime sector whereby um, use of those sort of automated analytics and so on were applied and the, the lessons, the learnings that came out of that were that um, when there was a man overboard incident, the, the precursors to that were being near the edge of the vessel. So, <laughs> so there's, there's making sure that you apply the right sort of intelligence to the process as well as sort of relying on that automated uh, process as well. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, I think we're getting to the time where we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, I've got one last question, but uh... I think James might just have answered that. What should people do next if they see value in this conference? Where should we go? Just get um, started. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely, John, absolutely. Um, it, it's about continuing the conversation, whichever part of the, the safety playing field you're, you're on. Um, it, it is about continuing the conversation, that continuing to be curious, to try and read up, to do some promotional activities, um, collaborate with people that you wouldn't necessarily have, have thought about um, 
and and just carrying on that that conversation i think that the safety behaviors making it the language uh, as uh, has been highlighted uh, simple and um easy that people can relate to so it may mean slightly tweaking how you talk um but it is about translating it into something that people can relate to and then you'll get better and richer conversations, whether you're an inspector going into a, a worthiness maintenance organization, or whether you're a pilot talking to another pilot, um, or thinking about that when you're communicating with a controller. So, so it, is, it is about that, talking about it, read up, be curious, don't just repeat from a book, but really take that and then challenge that um, and ask and be curious within your group, get that diversity of thinking. So um, that, that would be my recommendation. Excellent. Anyone else want to wrap it up? I think um, just to sort of reflect back on the cafe story, um, we really just got going. Um, eventually, you know, had to start bringing people um, who, who kind of had greater levels of responsibility on board. But it was really just about let's just start trying to trying to implement things in a small way let's carry out some small experiments let's start talking differently about safety and see if it catches on um so i think sometimes there can be quite a lot of inertia you know james mentioned all of these different kind of um, related theories that have all come from different academics and it can it can be a little bit overwhelming for people um but actually you know just try and pick out the, the bits that seem most relevant to you and just have a go at it um, try not to break anything. Um, I always say to people when I'm sort of in an organization, you know, we're, we're not trying to throw the baby out of the bathwater. What we are perhaps trying to do is, is drain some of the existing bathwater and refill it with fresh water. Um, so sort of bring the temperature up a bit. Um, I'm not sure if that's the best metaphor, but um, you know, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. So don't, you know, you don't have to go all guns blazing. And in fact, in the takeaways of our presentation, um, Val mentioned, look at the same stuff, but look at it in a different way. So you don't actually need to go on, oh, I need to go out and gather all this extra data. You just need to look at what you already receive, but differently, code it differently, you know, be more, be curious about it in a different way. Don't at attach normative and evaluative language to it, just be descriptive. So these little things you can tweak just to get you started and then hopefully that will snowball. Um, I want Adam, to if I can add, uh, add to that, Adam, I would say that that's consistent with the Forest Service's history too, where we, we simply presented leadership, senior leadership with something new and they liked it. And we continue to do that. And the process evolved then in concert with leadership once they were brought on board. But uh, I would agree with you, just do the little things, lead where you, where you stand, do the little things to, uh, to move forward. Thanks. Yeah, I would like to uh, echo what Adam said as well in terms of uh, just bringing the conversation. Uh, for us in CAFE, I am one of the newest members on the team. Uh, so I don't have a lot of experience in this. But one of the things we did was to adjust the way that we ask people when they write up a safety report, you know, what went well uh, in this particular event, you know, what has happened. And uh, funny enough, uh, recently we've started to notice that uh, because we've talked about, it so, talked about it so much in the last year, we've seen people using the resilience pillars in the, uh, the way that they write the ASR. I actually sent one to uh, Adam. Uh, we had a little chuckle because the guy actually uh, wrote that they anticipated this. They monitor this and they respond to this. And from this event, they learn from this. And then this is just, you know, great, great, great thematic analysis that we get, which, you know, we would never get before we start bringing in this language uh, about, about how uh, the res resilience language works in the, 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 the way that we work and give us a better understanding of how work is done, actually. Um, so so I, I do think that we start simple change language and that really helps in uh, getting, people, getting, getting people to keep a conversation going uh, and start it. Brilliant, thanks for that. I think another key with that, Locke, just to build on what Locke just said, is also just the, the cultural shift that we're seeing by the way we, we treat the pilot who comes to help us learn as the expert in the room. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the expert and they're there to help us. And we very quickly establish that relationship and it makes a huge difference. You know, people are willing to share, people are open, and hopefully they then go out and tell, you know, somebody else about the experience so that when they get a chance to come and share, they're willing to do so also. So we've seen a, a huge 
shift just in the mindset, I think. And it is, whether we want to call it a safe space or whatever label we want to give it, it's made a huge difference. You know, that, that sort of second and third order effect of, of implementing this. I think also, uh, James, just, you know, we've got to remember who, who's doing the work, right? It's, it's our frontline people. So what's really important is that you have to foster ownership in the culture from the front line. Um, you know, and I've always, my, I've always said to the team that, that, that management don't own this, all right? We don't own this. We, 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 we coach and mentor ownership and accountability in it. Um, and, and I think it's really, really important that, that um, you focus on, on who, the, who the customer is really. And, and to be honest with you, it's, it's it, you know, for us, it's our pilots. Um, and, you know, just to, just to, to, to reflect off what Pete just said, um, it's the best way to build trust in, 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 in any just culture, right? For example, you know, you've got to, you've got to have trust, you've got to have learning and you've got to have accountability. And, and if you start these conversations with a pilot, um, they are, they have a tremendous amount of ownership in that operation. I can guarantee you that, you know, I'm a pilot myself, right? So just like mo most of you know, the people watching here, um, we take a great, a great amount of accountability for what we do uh, every day and we have a lot of ownership in it. And, um, and, and if you can foster that ownership, then um, half the battle's won already. Um, and what you need to do is to, is to set the conversation up, change the language and then get out of the way <laughs> and let them run with it. Um, and, and you'll be amazed what comes back. Um, I mean, some of the insights that we've got just by having a conversation with a frontline person uh, is, is astonishing. It really is astonishing. Um, so if I can encourage everybody, um, you know, uh, out there that, that, that to, you know, if you're part of the, the, the if you're responsible for the system, um, just make sure you understand who's actually operating the system because that's the focus of where we're at, not, not management's control of it. Um, if management want control of the system, then um, you're in the wrong game as far as, as, far as we've learned from this. So, so uh, I, I would encourage, um, somebody said to me the other day, hey, Peter, all you've done at Cathay is legalise bar talk. <laughs> in terms, you know, because pilots learn a lot down the bar, you know, that's how we learn. We, we, we talk about in, a, in an informal environment with no, no structure around us. We, 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 we talk a lot about, you know, what just happened to us. We did this, we did that. All you've got to do is create a, you know, the label is psychological safe space, whatever you want to call it. Ed, I'll leave that to you, mate. That's, you're the expert, not me. But, you know, you create that space to have those conversations and then you will truly learn how work is done. Um, and so that's, I would really, really encourage people, um, you know, words create worlds, change the language, you want to change the culture, change the language. Um, but, but also remember that um, uh, the ownership is with the frontline staff because they're the ones that make it happen every day. They're the ones sitting in the sharp end of the business. And, um, uh, and, and it's quite amazing what insightful information you can get by just having a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one point on the, the conversations that we see through the OLRs, um, People come to it with their existing views quite often, and why wouldn't they? That's that's what they understand of the organisation, as it was. And you see um, resistance, or perhaps um, people not quite um, on board. And then you see as the interaction goes between the facilitators and the the pilots that the the whole thing changes. And by the end, there will be chatting about you, and there'll be and another thing. And this is when the the real um, useful information and the learning comes out. And it's very interesting to watch the shift and see it time after time. Yeah, exciting. As a union rep, that sounds like Nirvana. <laughs> really good. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here with past time. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Joji. Just say thanks very much for me, certainly for all your input, because it's been incredible. We've really, uh, really enjoyed the whole two days. Thank you. Great stuff. Thanks, James, for, for running that Q&A. What a great Q&A. It seems a shame to bring it to, to a close, doesn't it? But I thought it was another fascinating day um, with the real world ex operational examples um, adding such a valuable layer of context 
to help reinforce the, the, the theoretical grounding that we received yesterday. So again, uh, on behalf of James and I, a big thank you to all of our speakers, both from yesterday, um, today, and also to the additional um, cafe guys that joined the, the Q&A. A real big thank you to you all. I hope you found the experience um, as stimulating as we did through listening to you. Thanks also to the audience um, for your attendance, um, interest, comments, and, and questions throughout the two days. As I mentioned at the beginning of the conference, um, we hope this is the first of many similar events. You know, it's our desire to keep the conversation going uh, and to keep learning together. To that end, we'd be really grateful if you could fill in a short feedback questionnaire um, saying what you liked about the conference, what could be better, um, what subjects you would like to be covered maybe at a future conference. Um, so this, this questionnaire can be found on, on the Balper Safety Conference website. So please, please um, take a few minutes just to fill that in uh, and let us know your thoughts. Also, just to remind, um, we will also publish all of the um, website, on the website, all of the recordings from the, the, the two days, all four sessions, um, and where possible the presentations as well. So finally, I just wanted to mention one very brief thing, um, the Flight Safety Foundation uh, and the learning from all operations work they're progressing on the back of the excellent seminar they held last uh, autumn, last fall. Um, this is a global initiative that aims to promote um, in practice the principles of safety to safety resilience and systems thinking for safety to the different aviation segments and to all global regions. So clearly learning from resilience is an enhancement of existing risk-based safety management systems. So many of the speakers over the last two days are involved in this work. Um, Valpra uh, at least to be involved too. And their first task is to produce a white paper for the practical application um, of learning from all operations. So further information can be obtained um, about um, this initiative from Sylvester Blazhev, um, whose contact details we'll place in the, in the chat box for you, um, and we'll leave that open um, so you can, you can note that down. So once again, a massive thank you to, uh, to you all. Take care, stay safe, and hopefully see you again soon. All the best. Goodbye.